there's a chance that the first part of this is not going to have audio. We'll see. I'm getting better at it. First time I used it, well, I, I didn't even record. It was just sitting there, and I didn't realize it wasn't recording. Well, luckily, the first part is basically just a deal that we've already talked about. Yeah, right. Okay, so when these electrons approach, uh, these atoms approach one another, um, remember that the electronic structure, have we done that in here? Electronic structure. Like that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the electronic structure of hydrogen is like this, just 1s1. This one's 1s1. And the s orbitals can hold two electrons. That's it. So when they approach one another, they share those two electrons. Right? So now, this one thinks it has two, a complete shell. This one thinks it has two, a complete shell. It doesn't, but it behaves as if it has two electrons. And a completed shell is desirable. <clears throat> so that's that's the driving force for a reaction is completing those electronic shells. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, also, when we share two electrons, we represent that with a single dash. It's usually not that long, but a single dash means two electrons. So if we had two dashes in there, that would be two pairs or four electrons. So there's your shared pair of electrons, and that forms a bond. In fact, the covalent bond uh, is, as a group, much stronger than the ionic bond. Okay, so all you have to do is share electrons, uh, the, and those are the uh, valence electrons that are shared. We did talk about that, I'm sure. The valence electrons, those are the ones in the outermost energy level. And of course, since hydrogen has only got the one, that's its valence electron. Those are the ones that are available for sharing or transferring to another atom. So these are examples of um, binary compounds, covalent compounds where the electrons were shared. So what this says is fluorine donated one electron, hydrogen donated the other electron and formed a bond. So now hydrogen thinks it has two right here, where fluorine thinks it has two, four, six, eight. And fluorine uh, having access to the uh, S and P orbitals, remember the S can hold two maximum, P can hold six maximum, that gives you eight. That's where the concept of the octet comes from. So fluorine has an octet, um, hydrogen has a duet, uh, a, a diatomic fluorine, both of these fluorines think they have, in quotes, they think they have octets. Uh, bromine and fluorine could do the same thing. So you could have an octet, bromine thinks it has an octet, fluorine has its octet. It's just that bromine's octet, let's see, uh, fluorine is second level, whereas bromine is third level. But they still have octets. Okay? Now this, uh, modeling process is the um, Lewis dot structures. We did talk about that, didn't we? Lewis, okay. <clears throat> there, are, there are some electrons. We identify the bonding electrons, of course, those that are, uh, that actually form the uh, attraction between the two atoms are the bonding electrons. We show those between the atoms, and then everything else is non-bonding. Right? 
So fluorine in this case has six non-bonding, bromine has six non-bonding, and uh, two bonding. Oh, sometimes we call them uh, lone pairs. Non-bonding and lone pairs, those are synonymous. Okay, the bonding electrons are valence electrons. The ones that are shared and the lone pair electrons are non-bonding electrons, which are also valence electrons. All you have to have for a valence electron is have that number be the same for all of them. That principal quantum number, the energy level. Uh, defines the uh, valence electrons. <coughs> okay, so um, this dash, that's a single covalent bond representing two electrons. Uh, a double bond would be four electrons or two bonds. This is carbon dioxide. It doesn't show the non-bonding electrons, but they're there. And dinitrogen has a triple bond between the nitrogen. So it has six electrons or three pair for its bond. And this bond is very strong. So a double covalent bond has how many electrons? Four, two pair. Um, the non-metal elements have a strong tendency to form a specific number of covalent bonds. And after you do this enough, you sort of get a feel for how many that they like to form. Um, for instance, I need to use a different marker. Okay, so that means the battery is probably not going to hang in there. That's okay. I think this this other one will work. Okay. It'll probably be a better picture anyway. Okay, so back to our uh, carbon dioxide. The tendency for oxygen is to form two bonds. The reason for that is if we draw the Lewis dot structure, it has these two electrons that are available for bonding. And these form the lone pair, the non-bonding pair. So there's your two bonds. Whereas carbon has four individual electrons that are available for bonding. So it can form a covalent bond with each one of them. In this case, it forms two of them with oxygen. So you have the um, like that, form a bond here, form a bond with these two. And then on the other side, you form a bond here and here. So there's your double bond on this side, there's your double bond on that side. <coughs> Oxygen, in fact, um, the oxygen family tends toward two covalent bonds, whereas carbon uh, family tends toward four covalent bonds. Now it's not chiseled in stone, but it's it's a starting point, it's a trend. And they do it so that they can complete their octets. It takes four bonds to complete the octet for carbon whereas oxygen only takes two. And that has to do with their position. See where carbon is? One, two, three, four electrons shared with carbon will make it look like neon. Whereas oxygen only needs two, one, two, to make it look like neon. And that's what everybody wants to look like a noble gas. So that's just explaining what I just showed you. Nitrogen. Uh, if it 
uh, it tends to form three single bonds or a singular and a double or a triple. But it forms the three bonds in some form or fashion. If it forms bonds like this, a good example of that is ammonia. Okay. Um, well, this one, of course, the dinitrogen would give you that one. But also, Cyanide. Cyanide is a little different. In this case, carbon only forms three bonds. And that extra electron that was sitting up here just joins with this one. So, but it's extremely reactive. That's why cyanide is so dangerous. It's more reactive than oxygen with your hemoglobin. And it's and more reactive than that is carbon dioxide, and more reactive than that is carbon monoxide. But cyanide is more reactive than any of them. So when it bonds with your hemoglobin, uh, it doesn't take much. You're dead. Okay, so there are examples of carbon, the type of arrangements you can get. Uh, oxygen forms two bonds, usually. There's a special kind of covalent bond. I'll just mention this one in passing, and all you need to know is the definition. I'm pretty sure that's all you need. The, the coordinate covalent bond. Um, recall that when we had, uh, when we found uh, carbon with oxygen, where did the electrons come from? Well, one of them came from here, one of them came from there. But there are some molecules where both electrons come from one atom and form a bond with the second one. Um, that's just definition. It happens. In fact, um, these definitions and the theories that go with them are developed to explain reality. We don't. We don't invent reality to uh, support our theories. Right? <laughs> the theories have to be modified to support reality. <clears throat> and here's an example. Okay, so if um, uh, this molecule here needs to form a bond with oxygen, the um, let's see. You know, that arrow is going the wrong direction. Because the pair, the pair that's going to complete oxygen comes from here. Maybe it's form, it's showing the bonds forming. But I would I would draw the arrow the other direction. That came straight out of your book, so we can blame the authors. Uh, Stoker. Stoker's to blame for this one. So the the pair that uh, bonds is both of them, both the electrons are coming from this chlorine to form a bond with oxygen and give it its octet. And of course, chlorine already had an octet. So you have the, the covalent, coordinate covalent bond, both electrons coming from chlorine. Now, how do we know that? You have to use some alternate method of explanation because uh, after the compound is formed, you don't know where the electrons came from. You can track them from the beginning, but in the end, there's no way to tell. Okay, so this is the explanation for the formation of a regular covalent bond versus a coordinate covalent bond. In this case, uh, that atom and that atom share electrons one from each other. And for this one, well, that doesn't help us any. Doesn't explain why. They're indistinguishable from other covalent bonds. Once they're formed, 
you don't know. You sort of have to infer. Uh, so how would we do that? So in this case, uh, nitrous oxide. The oxygen forms only one bond. Right? So that's kind of a giveaway there because oxygen tends toward forming two bonds. So if it only forms one bond, you kind of want to suspect that it's not a regular covalent bond. It's, it's, it's coordinate. Carbon monoxide, you actually get three bonds formed with that oxygen instead of two bonds. So whenever the bonding is not normal, we suspect coordinate covalence. Okay, so that's just definition. So we know how to write uh, Lewis structures for atoms. So it, it's also, uh, it actually, it, the next step is to write the structure for a molecule. So here are the steps that you follow. Uh, you've got your compound. You already know what the compound is. So in this case, it's sulfur dioxide. And then you count the number of valence electrons for each of the atoms in that molecule. So sulfur and oxygen are in the same family. That means each one's going to have six electrons in its valence shell. All right, so three times six is 18. So we've got 18 electrons that have to be placed in that molecule. Um, all right, that's the first step. Second step is you write the chemicals in the molecule And this, this takes some practice and, and faith, actually, to know which one's in the middle. We would normally, uh, you may be tempted to put oxygens together on one side and sulfur on all by itself. But the thing is, sulfur is down here. It has access to 3D. So it, it's able to uh, form more complex structures than oxygen is. So that's one of the reasons that we tend to put sulfur in the middle when we can. So we've used up two, four electrons to make those bonds. So you just subtract them, keep track of how you're using them. We've got 14 electrons left. So the next thing you do is you start putting, you populating these electrons into your molecule and you start from the outside and work your way in. Right? So since oxygens, since got the same, we're going to go around like this. So there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, until you get an octet. So we got two electrons left over, and everybody's, well, oxygen's got an octet, but sulfur doesn't. So we can put uh, those two electrons, of course, then would go on the, um, you can put them together or you can put them like this, doesn't matter. So we've used them all up. Now we need to form an octet without destroying the octets that we already have. So the way we do it is we take these two electrons and form a double bond. So we put that one over here, this one over here, and we form another double bond. Okay. So now sulfur has six electrons, but it doesn't have a doctet yet. So now that we have a double bond on that side, then you would take one of these pairs and use it like a coordinate covalent. Make another double bond over here. Okay, so let's let's check ourselves. Um, wait a minute, that's not right. Because 
we have too many on that side. So far, that's where I was before. And there, okay. Now we have all the electrons populated. We take one pair from here and make a double bond there. Oh, I see what they're doing. Okay. This is not a perfect procedure. So we have so rather than use this one to make a bond, we're going to use one of these pairs to make a bond. So now we have That's right. So then you count up to be sure you got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen. So we got all our electrons in there, and everybody's got an octet. So that's one possible. That's another thing about Lewis structures. That's one possible structure. There are other valid Lewis structures that could be made from this. What if we put the double bond on this side? That'd be just as valid. If we did that, then we have we have something that looked like this. So now we have these, those, like that. So which one's right? It turns out both of them are. Only that's one of the problems with the with using the Lewis dot structures is that you can have multiple possibilities. And since there's no in-between writing, we can't write something that's in between these two. We say they resonate back and forth between those two. So the, the reality of these two Lewis dot structures is that the true structure is something in between those two. Okay. Lewis dot structure for hydrogen is just that. For fluorine, it's just that. And for hydrogen fluoride, it's just that. For ammonia, I showed you the ammonia a minute ago. We've done the carbon dioxide. Carbon tetrachloride takes advantage of the fact that carbon likes to form four bonds, and chlorine only likes to form one bond. Because one electron will make it look like argon. So the total number of dots in the uh, Lewis structure should be 18. Yeah. Of course, these lines represent two. So when they say dots, you can count those as two. So how about polyatomic ions? Now we're going to find out why polyatomics behave the way they do. <coughs> polyatomic ions fit into ionic compounds as whole entities. But within the polyatomic, those bonds uh, among the atoms in a polyatomic are covalent. And they're stronger than ionics. So they hold together as a unit while they go through their ionic gyration. For example, here's sulfate. So sulfate looks like this written simply, and as a two minus charge, right? So we write the structure like this with brackets and the two minus is out here because that charge is distributed over the entire unit. We don't put the charge on any one of these. We cover the whole thing. Though when we balance our ionic equation, we look at the charge on that one. Since it's only one, then we need two of them to balance the two minus. 
and the 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 bonding within the the polyatomic is covalent, but the bonding between the potassiums and the sulfate is ionic. So we have a mix of, of types of bonds. So how many valence electrons are present in the polyatomic? Okay, so let's remove this one and just look at the polyatomic. Sulfur and oxygen, again, are both in the same family, so each one has six. Right, so we have four, five. Five times six equals 30, right? But we've also got two negatives, an imbalance, which gives us two more electrons. So we've got a total of 32 electrons in that unit. Oops, there it is, 32. So when you start to do write the uh, polyatomic structure, uh, Lewis structure for a polyatomic, you need to take those charges into account. If it happens to be a positive, like ammonia, or ammonium, then you would have nitrogen at five, you would have four times one for hydrogen, and then you would have to subtract one for that. Right? So you have eight electrons would be distributed in the ammonium ion structure. Okay, so <clears throat> we've gone through all these gyrations to get to this point. We want to know what's the geometry of the molecule. And the Lewis dot structure helps us to get there. Um, one of the reasons we want to know that structure is it helps explain why some molecules are polar, that is, they act like they have a negative and a positive side, and some of them don't. They act like they're nonpolar. And it has to do with two things. Um, one is the polarity of the bond. So if you have a bond between two, if one of them has a stronger pull on electrons, then it's going to be more is slightly negative, and the other one's going to be slightly positive. And we designate those with a delta. Just slight. It's not a full charge. It's just slight. But it gives us a polarity that's directed that way with a positive on this side and a negative on that side. Um, so the polarity of the bond first, and then what is the resultant of all of the polarities of your bonds. Right? So you need to know something about the geometry. So you can find out, well, if you have uh, a molecule that's perfectly symmetrical and all of the bonds are to similar atoms, the same atom, except in different positions, then, and it's perfectly symmetrical, then those uh, polar bonds are going to cancel one another out. Because this one's pulling that way, that one's pulling this way, this is pulling that way. They just cancel out. So the resultant is zero polarity. And that's the case with um, carbon tetrachloride. But I have to explain why. How do we get the geometry out of all that? <clears throat> okay. Well, we use, we use a theory called BSEPR. That's short for valence shell electron pair repulsion. So we're, we're dealing with valence shell electrons, and they usually occur in pairs, but they don't have to. So that's kind of a misnomer. I guess it just kind of fit better than uh, electron group repulsion. And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. We use this theory to predict the geometry of our molecule. So what does it say? In its simplest form, the valence shell electron pair repulsion just means that all the electrons that surround a central atom, whether they're bonding or lone pairs, repel one another. And 
as a consequence, they try to get as far from one another as possible. <clears throat> uh, which minimizes the repulsive effects, right? The farther away you get two negative charges, the less force that they feel in their repulsion. So that's what they're trying to do, trying to get as far from one another as possible. And that means you need maximum separation. Of the electron groups, okay, here's what I mean by that. Um, for instance, let's say we have uh, ah, about formaldehyde, right? So what you would have here is uh, this group is repelling that group and repelling this group, and these two are repelling each other, and those are repelling. They're all repelling one another. But we treat this one as a single unit. Right? Even though it's a double bond, for the, the purpose of the theory, it's a single unit. Okay? That's what we mean by electron groups. Okay. Uh, So then, what do we do to use this theory and predict the geometry of a molecule? Well, you have to draw the Lewis structure first, so we go through all those steps to make the Lewis structure. Then you determine the electronic geometry. That is, if you have lone pairs, they have to be taken into consideration when you consider the geometry of the molecule. But first, you consider the uh, geometry with the lone pairs included. Then you just cover up the lone pairs and say, what are you left with? That's the molecular geometry. Okay, so that's where we're headed. Um, and here, here we say, no distinction is made between bonding and non-bonding electron groups in that first step where you determine the electronic geometry. Uh, and that just says what I said. <laughs> you do the electronic geometry, then you cover up the electron groups and say, what are you left with? Okay, so here's an example. And the geometry, I, I will say this, the geometry of a molecule is uh, based upon a central atom. Right, so if you have uh, of multiple atoms in your molecule, you say the geometry around that atom or the geometry around that atom. They can be different. Okay. So for carbon dioxide, what's the geometry around what's the geometry around that carbon? Well, we say how many groups Electron groups are around the carbon. We've got one, two. Right. So if we have two groups, the electronic geometry is linear. That's how these get as far apart from one another as possible. Right? That makes this effect linear on either side. Um, similarly for, for this one, you've got a group here and you've got a group here. So around that carbon, you're still linear, right? So since we have no lone pairs to cover up, the uh, molecular geometry is also linear. If there are uh, Lone pairs. See, we just fit this in here. Lone pairs. Zero lone pairs. Okay. So if you have zero lone pairs, then the molecular is the same as the electronic. How about this one? 
So if we have, there's your, um, formaldehyde, excuse me, one, two, three. So if you have three groups, the farthest apart they can get is trigonal planar, that is form a triangle in a plane. So what we're doing is we're saying from there to there to there to there is a triangle. So we have trigonal planar if there are three groups. And in this case, there are no long pairs, so it's also a trigonal planar. But in this case, for sulfur dioxide that we drew a little earlier, we've got a group here, a group here, and a lone pair there, so that's three. So if you have three, it's still trigonal planar, electronic, but if we have one lone pair, then what do we have left? We cover that up. Your book calls it angular. I like bent. So that's bent molecular geometry, and it's bent because this still has an impact, but the molecule itself is like that, bent. Water's like that too. If you draw water, two, four, six, eight, there's an octet. Um, Actually, with water, with water you have four, so four groups means tetrahedron, right? So you would have uh, like that. So you'd have the tetrahedron shape, the four sides are all equivalent, and you would have a hydrogen here hydrogen there, lone pair in the back, lone pair up here. So if you cover up those lone pairs, you have the bent molecule. So in this case, it would be tetrahedron, but you have two lone pairs, and that would also make it bent. So this example is sulfur dioxide, and this example is water. Uh, trigonal planar, this example was formaldehyde, uh, H2CO, and this one was carbon dioxide. Okay. Are you getting sleepy? <laughs> okay. So here we have um, uh, methane, right? Methane has four hydrogens around. So you have four groups, tetrahedron, methane. Four groups, tetrahedron, no lone pairs, it's still tetrahedron. Okay, the next one is ammonia. So ammonia has that one lone pair, but has four groups, so it's still tetrahedron electronic, but with one lone pair, it becomes a trigonal pyramid. Okay. So it has a triangular base with nitrogen at the apex at the trigonal pyramid. And there's water. We got water already. Make sure I get the whole board in. <clears throat> okay, so when you have a molecule with more than one central atom, you can have uh, you can have the same structures, or you can have uh, different structures around that central atom. In this case, both are linear because acetylene; those carbons are equivalent. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, same thing. So you have a tetrahedral electronic, but it's bent at each one of these oxygen, or angular. For this one, uh, hydrazine, or hydrogen azide, excuse me, 
uh, hydrogen azide. Around this nitrogen, you have one, two, three. So that's going to be trigonal planar. But molecular is going to be angular. Now this one. This one's got two. So two means two groups, means linear. And since there are no lone pairs, it's still linear. Right? So you have angular here, molecular, and linear molecular for that one. So you can have different structures. You have to specify which atom you're talking about. Oh, there they are, pictures. Okay. Uh, I pulled this out of a different text, I think. I don't think the one in, in your book is adequate. So this tells you what you've got uh, electronically. Let's see. Uh, these examples are where the uh, molecular and the electronic structures are identical because there are no lone pairs. Right? So two pairs give you that structure, three give you that, tetrahedron. If you have five, you have a trigonal bipyramid. That is, the farthest you can get away from each other is with three of them around this way and two at the apexes. And then, of course, if you have six, the octahedron is the most efficient distribution. So if we have um, okay tetrahedron, right? this would be uh, methane or carbon tetrachloride, and the molecular would be identical. This one is like ammonia, so you have one lone pair, and it becomes trigonal pyramid as a molecule. Whereas this one is water, example of water, and it becomes benzene. If we have a trigonal bipyramid, so one, two, three, four, five groups, and they're all occupied, then the molecular structure is just the same. But what happens if you have one lone pair out of those five? Well, the most efficient place to put it is here, because it puts it 90 degrees away from that one and 60 degrees away from these guys. Whereas if you put it up here, it would be 90 degrees away from three of them. And the repulsive effects are too severe. So what you end up with molecular is a seesaw, right? There's your base and there's the board on your seesaw. Um, if you have a, uh, two lone pairs in this five group arrangement, then you have a T-shape. Right. That one's far from that one, and that one is over here. So that's the most efficient way to keep them apart. And then you get a T-shape. If you uh, have uh, a molecule with three group, uh, five groups, but three of them are lone pairs, then you, you're back to linear again. So the molecular structure can be really complex. It just depends on what's the distribution of the groups first, then how many of them are lone pairs. Okay, so what are the bond angles? Well, on a linear, it's obvious. The bond angle puts the atom of interest at the center, and then the angle is formed like that. So a linear is 180 degrees. Um, a trigonal pyramid, well, Let's back up. Before we do that, how did we get ammonia? We started with a tetrahedron. The bond angles in a tetrahedron are 109.5 degrees. Okay? If it's a perfect tetrahedron and you don't have any lone pairs, that will be your bond angle. So this one will be 109.5 degrees. But if you have a lone pair, what does that lone pair do? Uh, I messed up my ammonia. So let's put... Uh, hydrogen back here, and nitrogen's in the middle with this one lone pair. So you start off with 109.5, but what happens to these, this lone pair? 
Lone pair electrons tend to balloon. They're not confined within a bond. So they tend to balloon out. And they put pressure on the other bonds. They squeeze them down. So that's why for ammonia, it's not 109.5, but 107, because they've been pushed down. Um, so um, water, since you've got two lone pairs, these would be pushed even further. And instead of 107, like this one, they're closer to like 105 degrees. It pushes them even further down. So there's our valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Now, the concept of electronegativity tells us um, the polarity of a bond. Right? So you need to know what's the difference between the electronegativity between one atom and the next in that bond. So we have to define what electronegativity is. The electronegativity of an atom is defined as the ability of the atom in a molecule to attract electrons that are shared to itself. So in order for electronegativity to be calculated, which it is, it is a real value, you have to have that atom in a molecule with some other atom to compare it with. Okay. So usually what you do is you put that um, atom in a molecule with an identical atom, same element. Okay, that electronegativity difference is zero. Then you put it in a, a molecule with another atom for which the electronegativity has already been determined. Then you measure the difference between the two. And you use that value compared to what you know of the other one to find out what the new one is. And you just do that over and over and over again. You get graduate students to do it for nothing. And then maybe if, if it gets serious enough, you'll, you'll get a, a real scientist involved. But it costs more money. It takes more expensive equipment. <clears throat> the the most, most quoted electronegativity numbers, and there are several systems, the most quoted one is the Pauling system, uh, proposed by Linus Pauling. Uh, and it, it runs from almost zero, down here in this lower left-hand corner, to four, 4.0, 4 or very close to that, for fluorine. Fluorine is the highest electronegativity element in the chart. Uh, and then they, they run the gamut in between. So we need to look at what are the trends for the periodic table. Because if you're going to form a bond between something way over here and something way over there, the electronegativity difference is going to be huge. And the larger the electronegativity difference, the more ionic the character. Because one's going to be pulling harder, way harder than the other one. Whereas if you compare uh, covalents, they're going to be pulling a little bit tug over here, but no, you can't have all of it. So that's why they share, because one can't overcome the other. Uh, okay, so here's the trend. Across periods, from left to right, across in a single period, uh, across their, your groups, the electronegativity increases from left to right. Uh, within a group, as you go up the period, the electronegativity increases toward the top. So if you combine those two effects, over the entire table, that's just one dimension, this way and that way. Combine it in two dimensions, the general trend is lower left to upper right, you increase electronegativity. The strength of pull on the electron increases. Now, that trend holds fairly well for the representative elements, these guys and these guys. When you cross through here, uh, it kind of goes roller coaster because you're dealing with uh, uh, d orbitals. And we don't even talk about the f orbitals. Because these guys, um, they're 
outer electron shells are almost identical. They only vary in the F, and the F is kind of at a lower energy level. So uh, they basically have the same electronegativity across all of the lanthanides and actinides. Oops. Okay. So that's why we only include in this chart the <coughs> representative elements, right? The S orbital fillings and the P orbital fillings. So we go from lower left, rubidium is very low. I don't know why they left out, uh, they left out cesium and francium. Cesium is even lower than rubidium. But you'll notice that if you go up, electronegativity increases, and you go left to right, electronegativity increases. There's the general trend. Left to right, bottom to top, increase. Now, why does that happen? Okay, here's, here's the conventional wisdom for why uh, those trends are the way they are. From left to right, what are you doing? You're adding a proton. Number of protons are increasing. You're actually increasing the effective electron, uh, effective nuclear charge as you go from left to right. So as you increase the number of protons from left to right, you increase the pull on electrons. And you're not adding any new energy levels. So as you add electrons, I mean protons and electrons, the electron cloud tends to shrink as you go from left to right. So as it gets closer, uh, the electron cloud shrinks, with the, even with additional electrons. Um, you tend to increase the ability of that at that next element to draw electrons to itself. Uh, how about top to bottom? Um, let's see. So as you're going from, well, let's say from top to bottom, you're going to decrease electronegativity. Why is that? Well, what you're doing is you're adding you may be adding protons, but you're also adding another energy level. And those inner electrons, the core electrons, tend to shield the uh, effect of the protons that you're adding. So you're actually decreasing the effect of the nuclear charge by adding another level, which is now becomes your valence shell. And also, um, as you, let's see, yeah, there it is. The core electrons shield the nucleus and reduce the effect of the nuclear charge. That means they pull on the electrons less effectively because they're surrounded by so many other electrons. Okay. So if we, if we make a compound with lithium and fluorine, which element will have more attraction for the electrons? I just look where they are on the chart. Okay, fluorine's way over here, lithium's way over there. So fluorine's going to have a stronger attraction for electrons. It's more electronegative. And then what kind of bond is going to form? Well, uh, there's a, a rule. Uh, if you take the actual value and subtract the lower from the higher, then the difference is greater than two then the ionic character will dominate. If it's less than two, then you start to increase the amount of covalent character. But if you just look at, they're way far, it's got a metal over here and a non-metal over there, then they're, the electronegative uh, non-metal is going to uh, actually take one or more electrons from the metal. And the metal is only too happy to give them up. Okay. So which of these has the highest electronegativity? Let's see if we can work with the, with the trends. Hydrogen's uh, a little difficult because it sort of sits off by itself. We don't know where to put it. But it only has one electron, one proton. So it's 
electronegativity is generally in this range right in here, equivalent to these guys. But helium uh, should have very low attraction for electrons. The reason being, it has a full complement. I mean, this shell is full, doesn't care. So it really is the difference between oxygen and chlorine. So where is oxygen? Oxygen's here. So it should be more electronegative than chlorine because chlorine is in another uh, period and it's got more shielding of its inner uh, protons. So, yeah, we were right. Oxygen is the most electronegative of all those. So now we talk about bond polarity. In a covalent bond, we don't, we don't use the term polarity in terms of ionic bonds because we're saying that the electrons are completely transferred. Those bonds are ionic. We talk about polarity when uh, we're discussing covalent bonds because the electrons are shared. So we want to know how shared are they? Are they shared equally, like in the middle, between like nitrogen and nitrogen? be an equal pole or oxygen oxygen or is there a difference like between uh, I don't know carbon and fluorine there's a sufficient difference there to give you a polar bond so carbon okay let's back down here okay it's recording settings, high definition, good deal. Okay, we're back in business. I'll just, when I, when I post the whole thing, I'll have to splice them together. Okay, so let's get back to, uh, get back to this topic. Uh, okay, so the bonds can have a uh, nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or an ionic character. Now, let's see if we can arrange these in <coughs> descending order of polarity, that is, the most polar to the least polar. So the, the most polar are going to be the ones that are farthest apart from each other in the periodic chart. So nitrogen and fluorine, okay, that should have some polar character. How about oxygen? Oxygen is less polar because it's closer. How about carbon? Carbon should be more polar. So I would say the most polar would be uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. In order, most to least. How about carbon and fluorine? Okay. That one was easier because we had one of the same here. Now we've got to say, all right, what's the difference between these two? Carbon and fluorine, they're, uh, they've got two in between them. Nitrogen and oxygen, they're right next door. So this one should be the least polar. How about silicon and fluorine? Well, silicon is below and to the left. So it should be, we should have silicon, carbon, Nitrogen, silicon, carbon, nitrogen should be the order. Um, for this one, uh, polarity, that's going to be nonpolar. That's not polar at all. So all we have to do now is compare boron and sulfur. So there's boron and there's sulfur. I would say boron is farther away than sulfur is, so boron should be the most polar, sulfur should be the least, it should be the next, and then chlorine, chlorine should be the Can't get loaded with zero. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so let's see what the question asks. Which of the following is the least polar, yet still polar covalent? So what you do there is you eliminate the ionics. The 
before you even go to the polar covalents. So the ionics would be, that's a metal and a non-metal, throw that one out. Uh, silicon and oxygen is pretty close. That's gonna be um, two polar, right? We'll throw this one out too because it's not polar at all. Right? So it's really a toss up between carbon and nitrogen as the least polar. So let's see, carbon and oxygen, nitrogen, nitrogen, oxygen should be the least polar. All right, so we get rid of those. And these are the closest together in the periodic table. That would give you the, it's still polar covalent, but it's the least polar covalent. On ours, they still have oxygen on this. Oh, how'd that happen? Um, let's see. Yeah. Now this should be right. Right. So let me make that note here because uh, mine's probably the same as yours in the Supreme Court. Yeah, that should be moved down. Oh, I actually accidentally poked the button. That happened a lot. Okay. So that's what it should be. Closest together in the periodic table. That makes sense. Also, it says furthest away in the periodic table. Oh, is that the next one? Oh. <laughs> we haven't got there yet. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so I corrected, so I corrected so the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I do that kind of garbage all the time. Okay, most polar without being ionic. Okay, so we would throw this one out again, throw that one out again because it's not, it's ionic. And then we would look at uh, which is the most polar. So the farthest apart. Uh, carbon oxygen is got one in between them. Nitrogen oxygen is the least polar. Silicon oxygen is probably the most polar because it's below and to the left of oxygen. Yeah. There you go. So in a polar covalent bond, there's unequal sharing of electrons between two atoms. That makes it polar. So be sure and uh, and work those end of chapter problems and give you practice doing this kind of stuff. So now we get to molecular polarity. We have talked about bond polarity at this point. Molecular polarity combines uh, all the bond polarities in the molecule and its geometry. Okay, so you can have polar bonds, but if they're positioned in such a way that they cancel one another out, if it's symmetrical, then the entire molecule is nonpolar. Right? For instance, uh, carbon dioxide. That's nonpolar because the carbon oxygen bonds are slightly polar, but they cancel one another out. Water, on the other hand, is definitely a polar molecule right, because it's bent. And the, in physics, we call it the resultant. So if you have a vector going this way and a vector going that way, the combination of the two is kind of like that. Okay. So that's our, our polarity of uh, water molecules. Uh, true or false, a molecule that has polar bonds will always be polar. 
because the bonds are polar, doesn't mean the molecules are polar. Depends on the geometry. Okay. Um, what if we draw the Lewis structure for silicon dioxide and infer some things from that? So silicon is four electrons. And four here, and two times six is 12 here. So we have 16 electrons that have to deal with. So we have silicon. When you first start out drawing a uh, Lewis structure, um, it doesn't matter where the bonds go. You'll decide their directions later. All right, so we have four there. Means we have 12 electrons left. So that's six and 12. So they're all used up. The problem is silicon <laughs> it doesn't have a octet yet. So we make an octet for silicon by doing that, doing this, and now silicon dioxide is like that, that. Okay, silicon. So, with two groups, what's our electronic structure? Linear. What's our geometric structure? Uh, our molecular structure? Linear. So, even though um, oxygen pulls like that and pulls like this, they balance one another out. And the molecule is nonpolar. Well, I guess it's going to leave it up to me to explain it. Well, let's look at these and see if we can decide which one is polar and which one's nonpolar. Well, if you've got two fluorines together, it's definitely nonpolar. We don't even have to draw that one. <clears throat> HF. That's definitely polar. Since there's only one bond, the geometry, the linear geometry says that that's going to be polar. Right? Uh, how about ammonia? Right? So you're going to have uh, nitrogen pulling like that, all these directions. All those directions. And um, they're not balanced. They're in that trigonal pyramid. So we're going to have a slight negative here and slight positive there. So ammonia is polar. Silicon dioxide, we just did that one, didn't we? That's nonpolar. Carbon tetrachloride, right? We know that carbon tetrachloride is tetrahedral. Because you've got four groups and they're all symmetrical. So even though each one has uh, polarity in the bond, they cancel one another out. So carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar. That's why it made such a good dry cleaning agent. Because right? uh, the soiling of our clothes is largely oily, right? oil from our skin. And carbon tetrachloride would, uh, being a nonpolar solvent, would easily dissolve that nonpolar oil and carry it away. The trouble was it was hazardous. Uh, dry cleaning workers were getting sick. So OSHA and uh, uh, EPA stepped in. Said you can't do that anymore. So they had to come up with a substitute that was nonpolar, right? Would do the cleaning job and not damage the fabrics, but still uh, be safer to use. So that was polar, and that was polar. That was polar. Sure. Did I miss something? Oh, oh, oh. Silicon dioxide we did earlier. Yeah. 
uh, sulfur dioxide is uh, symmetrical, right? It's linear. So it's going to be, uh, no, it's not. It has that lone pair. It has the lone pair over the sulfur. So it's going to be like that. There you go. Okay, so when you cover that up, the polarity in which oxygen is just slightly more polar than sulfur. Okay, so sulfur dioxide is also polar. Uh, I'm gonna let you do these. One concept we haven't come we haven't come across yet. We may have mentioned it before. And that is the idea of uh, incomplete octets or excess octet. Have we talked about that yet? You have some compounds that are definitely there, but when we draw their Lewis structures, we can't make an octet with them. This is one. Right? Boron should have three, and then three of these, one each, equals six. So if we do that, two, four, six, that's it. We're out of electrons. So boron has a deficient octet, but it does exist. So those are cases where you just have to deal with it. Uh, let's see. Where's one where we exceed the octet? Uh, let's see. One of the sulfur would be a good one. You can't think of a real one, you just make one up. Yeah, how about uh, sulfur? Sulfur hexafluoride. Oops, not hydride. Let's see if that one works. So this is six times seven is forty-two, and sulfur is six. So that's forty-eight. So we put sulfur in the middle. So one, two, three, four, five, six, fluorine. So we have eight here times six is 48. Okay, so uh, the fluorine don't have octets, but the sulfur has two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, and 12. Okay. It exceeds the octet by a lot, but it's a real compound. So we just have to deal with it. You writing that down? Um, yeah, I wrote it down. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, we already talked about this. This is a type three compound, binary molecular compounds. All you have to do is just say how many there are with the one caveat that if your first one, the one that occupies the cation position, but it's not a cation, uh, is if it's a single, you don't say mono. Uh, you never start a type three compound with mono. So if you have like that, you don't say mono carbon dioxide, you say carbon dioxide. Don't ask me why. I guess it just sounds better. Carbon dioxide, okay, sulfur hexafluoride, and dinitrogen tetroxide. We 
drop the A out of that one. It will say tetra octet. Some of these, I think some of the naming conventions are aesthetic. And I think we covered these prefixes before. We just need to know what those mean, how to use them. Some have uh, trivial names. In other words, when I say trivial, that's a technical term. They have names that um, have just been accepted over the centuries. They're sort of grandfathered in. So there's water, hydrogen peroxide, of course, any, any compound that has uh, a double, a oxygen-oxygen uh, in the middle. And these groups can be anything. That's a peroxide. Right. So we could say uh, uh, like that. So that'd be methyl ethyl peroxide. Hydrazine, uh, ammonia, skip ammonia. And hydrazine. Hydrazine is a very reactive compound. The Nazis were using it in their rockets. They had this little rocket plane. Before the, um, the ME162 jet plane came out, they were playing around with this little rocket plane. They were using hydrazine as part of the fuel. And they were killing pilots left and right, killing ground crews. The stuff was so volatile and so reactive. What was the most reactive volatile that exists? Oh. I don't know. I have to look it up and see if there's if there's agreement on it, because there's some very reactive, and I guess it depends. Um, not just the molecule, but what's its environment. Right? Because um, you've got to be able to, to hold the molecule unreactive someplace before you actually do the reaction. So like uh, potassium metal is very reactive with water. So that's why uh, if you walk into a lab storage room, you're going to find your pota potassium in a bottle of mineral oil, submerged in the mineral oil to exclude water. That way, you don't get it reacting and setting your lab on fire. <laughs> okay. Uh, this one, of course, is in the news a lot. Nitric oxide. It's supposed to be a man booster. It increases circulation. So if you buy uh, Super Beets, that's one of the products that you can buy and, and mix it in your water and drink it. And it's supposed to increase your nitric oxide. Uh, uh, allow your um, the vasodilator makes your vessels expand, so your blood pressure is lowered, your flow is to all your other organs is increased. Nitrous oxide, of course, is laughing gas. Every dentist has some in their office. So let's see if we if these are named correctly. Nitrogen dioxide. Yep. Phosphorus pentoxide. That's wrong, right? You got two of them. So it needs to die phosphorus pentoxide. How about phosphorus trichloride? That looks good. Sulfur trioxide. That looks good. Iodine monochloride. That looks good too. So the only one that's wrong is that one. Which one is penta? Five. Yeah, five. Yeah. Five. I just like a pentagram, you know, witching symbol. It's got five points. I always thought pentagon. Okay, pentagon. Yeah. Uh, okay. So if we have a compound that's uh, carbon, hydrogen, chlorine only, carbon, hydrogen, chlorine, 
and those ratios, 1, 1, 3, which one of the following represents the Lewis structure and the molecular geometry? Okay. Let's see if we have the right. So there's one carbon, one hydrogen, and three chlorine. One carbon, one hydrogen, three chlorine, that's good. One, one, three, one, one, three. Okay, so we got we've got the right ratio for all of them. We just have to say, all right, let's eliminate the ones that can't possibly be. So how about hydrogen that has too many electrons? Throw that one out. So if we've got four groups around this carbon, the electronic structure should be tetrahedral. But was that the question? Back up. Uh, which of the following ways to structure? Molecular geometry. So the molecular geometry for each one would be tetrahedral. Right? So we threw that one out. We have to throw this one out too, because that's the wrong geometry. So it's between B and D. And uh, is it an ionic compound or a covalent compound? Well, they're all nonmetals, so it's got to be a covalent compound. Okay. Process of elimination, test making techniques, and all that stuff. Uh, the liquid molecular compound that's given to you and you're told to handle it with caution. If you cause damage or death, it is, if it's consumed in large quantities, if it enters your lungs, if you're hit with a frozen chunk of this material, if the hot solution spilled on you. However, this liquid is necessary to sustain life. The liquid is pure molecular compound, no taste, contains hydrogen, oxygen only. Identify the liquid as the molecular geometry, whether it's polar or nonpolar. It's got to be water. Yeah, identify the liquid. All four are water. All four are water, yeah. Uh, at least we could do is put something different in there. <laughs> okay, identified. <laughs> uh, how about molecular geometry? Well, we've already determined it's angular. It's, it's a bent molecule. And since it's bent and the, the bonds are polar, then the molecule has to be polar also. Okay. My dad used to say, that's enough of that foolishness. So let me stop this recording.